Today, Bill and I are having a day out in Portsmouth to see the warrior over there. And here's our transport to Portsmouth, the Gosport Ferry. <coughs> Bill gets the tickets for the ferry. Two OAPs, please. And then we're off down the gangway and soon on board. It's a wonderful service, crossing every 15 minutes and not expensive at all. Getting off is as easy as getting on, and as we join the exiting throng, we get a better view of the warrior. Long, isn't she? Once you get to this point, you travel back in time to October 1863. At the entrance, we were given a printed guide describing the ship and its UK tour. and inside a layout of the four decks. We started on the upper deck. The sheer size of the upper deck caught me quite by surprise. Everything is so massive. This is one of three sets of steering wheels. There are two more on lower decks. In heavy weather, every one would be manned probably 20 plus men. As you can see, the bulwarks are very high to protect the sailors on deck. In order to see over, they built a bridge for the captain and officers. From here, they would issue course instructions. Today, we still call the command center of a ship the bridge. Next, we made our way down to the main deck, through this solid iron blast door and onto the gun deck. As you'd expect, there are a lot of guns, big ones, mostly muzzle-loaded smoothbore, but aft there are the latest breech-loading 110-pound cannons with rifled barrels. These have a range of some five miles. The French, who were our rivals at the time, only had cannons with one-mile range, so I guess this ship was the nuclear deterrent of its day. Remember I said there were other steering positions? Well, here's the one on the gun deck, along with two compasses and a rudder position indicator. There are a lot of rifles here too, in case the enemy managed to get on board, and as a last resort, swords when things get very personal. The gun deck is really the centre of the ship, and home for 520 men. They ate, worked and slept here. See the hooks in the beams? The men would sling hammocks between them. They also slept on the tables and anywhere else available. No privacy at all. No loos either. They were expected to poop at the bow of the ship, at the heads. Their personal gear and spare clothing were stored in a kit bag in the seamen's flats on the deck below. So it wasn't much fun for being an ordinary seaman. However, higher ranks had better accommodation. The higher you went, the better it was, until you became captain, when the accommodation was very fine and a world away from the seamen just a few metres away. Even here, in all this splendour, you could never forget that you were on board ship. Those ropes, just above the lady's head, control the steering rudder. They must have been a bit noisy when underway. And that wasn't all. Through a door was access to the mechanism that raised the propeller into a tube to reduce its drag when sailing. No mean feat, apparently. It needed 600 men to raise it. Forward of the captain's quarters is the half-deck, where the commander and master lived in refined splendour. We left all this opulence behind and made our way down steps to the lower deck, where we explored the sick bay. All a bit rudimentary by today's standards. Nice beds though. The forward end of the lower deck is a sort of maintenance and support area. So there are bathrooms. 
also cells to hold miscreants. They would unpick rope to make oakum. There's stowage for seamen's kit, a sailmaker's area, a replacement uniform store, and then equipment for divers who clean the ship's underwater surface. We continued aft through this watertight door and past the third set of steering wheels. The issuing room holds basic stores and issues them to the duty mess cook. He then prepares the food and it is actually cooked in the galley on the gun deck. I was keen to see the engines so we went down another ladder to the all up and hold. I knew there would be furnaces but no idea how many. There are 10 boilers and each boiler has 4 furnaces. That's 40 furnaces. The ship's complement included 9 leading stokers and 66 normal stokers. That's 75 men altogether. They were tough guys working in temperatures of 45 degrees C. The hardest physical work on the ship. The coal for the furnaces is stored in bunkers around the boilers and is removed by the stoker stroke trimmers into wheelbarrows and then piled alongside each stoker. At some stage the trimmers would need to go into the bunkers and shovel the coal closer to the bunker entrance. Not a nice job. All this to feed this monster with steam. A twin cylinder single expansion steam engine which turned the propeller at around 66 revs a minute. It was manufactured in Greenwich, London by J. Penn and Sons, and at full power it generated 4,100 shaft horsepower. Even when it wasn't in use, it still required quite a lot of attention. Well, here we are, back on the upper deck with very tired feet. It's a big, complicated ship, <coughs> lots of ladders and things to see. But a shout out is required for the actors that represented the crew in 1863. They did a very good job and answered all questions in character. So is that it? Well not quite. By an amazing coincidence the house over the road from me was being cleared and a neighbour gave me this picture of Pera, a steam and sailing ship built for the Pacific and Oriental P&O shipping line. Quite a similar layout to the Warrior. The Perra was built on the banks of the Thames by C.J. Mayer and Co. She was completed in 1856 and there is an account of her doing timed trials off the measured mile at Stokes Bay, just a mile or two from Portsmouth. On board was Admiral Thornton and Captain Engeljew the ship averaged over 12 knots in the trials. Shortly afterwards, the Navy placed an order for the Warrior. The Warrior was built by the Thames Ironworks and Shipbuilding Company, who took over C.J. Mayer in 1859 when they were faced with bankruptcy. So the Pera could well have been an influence on the decision to build the Warrior. An amazing coincidence that I was given the picture at this time. Oh, no.